So what we're going to look at today um, is functional Hallux limitus, and we're going to look a little bit about the um, pattern mechanics and also the sorts of um, orthotic therapy uh, that we could use. So I've got that picture in there. I've used that on previous presentations. I like that picture of the mug and the podiatrist and what we do and precision guesswork. And I think there's actually probably quite a lot of truth in that, although obviously it's a bit of a, a jokey picture. Um, so today we're looking at something a little bit different from the norm. Normally we tend to look at specific conditions and we talk around that. Um, but today we're going to look at Hallux limitus. Um, so Hallux limitus or functional Hallux limitus uh, is not a diagnosis. It's actually a finding which can potentially lead um, to a range of conditions. Um, and as usual with podiatry, uh, many and varied are the thoughts on this topic. Um, so for those of you who have watched my webinars before, I'm not going to give you a black and white outline of exactly what Hallux limitus is and how to treat it. Um, but we're just going to go through some of the things I've mentioned there. So look at the definitions, look at the concepts, um, bring some of the research into it, um, and generally uh, give you something to think about and take away. Um, in fact, I think in some incidences, again, I'll be raising more questions than I actually answer. So, uh, so yeah, as I've said, it's a sceptical topic. Um, it's not a diagnosis, although I have previously many times seen it written as, as such. Um, in clinical findings, but it's a bit like our, our, our good old friend overpronation. You know, if you write that down, it's simply a description of what you're seeing in your patient. So it's a term for the pathology, um, but it's not actually a diagnosis. So uh, when I was researching this presentation, um, there wasn't a huge amount of good solid research um, on this topic, which I thought was quite interesting. I thought I was going to find loads, but I didn't. Um, but basically, uh, Hallux limitus could cover a wide range of topics, so things like um, Hallux abducto valgus, Hallux rigidus, um, osteoarthritis in the first MPJ, osteochondritis, first, uh, first ray hypermobility, um, and there's loads more. So we could actually do separate presentations on all of these in their own right, so as I said, it is quite a broad topic. Um, so a gory picture for you there. Um, now the importance of the first ray um, is not a new thing at all. So the, the picture I've just put up here, this is actually a prosthesis from an Egyptian mummy. So I think it basically highlights that for thousands of years we've been away, aware um, of how important um, the first toe joint is. Um, and also if you think about it, and you think about the patients that you see in your clinics every day, um, how many of them complain about problems just in this tiny little joint? Um, and they always think it's nothing to worry about because they're more concerned about the hip or the knee joint. But even with patients that haven't necessarily come in to see you with first MPJ pain in the first place, um, I do tend to find quite, especially in the elderly, a lot of patients um, do complain about it in conjunction to whatever else they've come in with. So, so my experience, I think, I think it's very common. So first and foremost, let's split Hallux limitus down into two categories and, and look what the differences are here. So, so on the left there, we've got structural Hallux limitus. Um, so this refers to um, a lack of dorsiflexion, both non-weight bearing and weight bearing. Um, so basically, it sort of creates um, a math mechanical blockage um, at all time. So this usually occurs because of trauma to the joint. Um, but then the likelihood is you're going to pick this up in your patient history if you've asked them sort of about the history of the problems or the pain they're getting. Um, functional hallux limitus is a bit different. Um, it was first described in 1972 um, and it basically says that the adequate dorsiflexion or you've got adequate dorsiflexion, non-weight bearing, um, but significantly reduced when weight bearing. So it's, it's okay when your patient's lying prone or supine non-weight bearing on the couch. And then as soon as you, you stand them stand them up and put that joint into weight bearing, then you get a significantly reduced range of motion in that first MPJ. Um, so according to the paper I've mentioned here, or the, the one I've referenced, um, a guide for these limits is greater than 50 degrees of dorsiflexion when non-weight bearing, so when you're, you're measuring them on the couch. But then when you stand them up, you're getting less than 12 degrees when the same patient goes into weight bearing. So um, I'd lose that, use those figures sort of loosely. I said it has been quoted in the research, but then you've also got to think about who's taking the measurements with a goniometer and how reliable is that. Is that. So, but I think that does serve as uh, quite a good little guide there. Now, we couldn't talk about functional hallux limitus and sagittal plane motion without mentioning Howard Dannenberg's sagittal plane theory. I think that's probably quite well imprinted on, on a lot of our, our minds. Um, now, while some of this has been challenged, um, as is kind of everything, I think his principles and the way he writes it do serve as a really good background for how the first MPJ functions. Uh, so what I'll do, um, let's just read some of that out. So 
and this is quoting some of his papers and as I say that everything's referenced at the back so um, do read up on this um, if, if you want a bit of revision but basically he says first MPJ range of motion is essential for the erect posture and the activation of the foot's natural function during gait and then he talks a lot about sagittal plane deficiency so how a limited range of motion at the first MPJ could lead to an inhibition of, um, of natural function now he calls it auto supportive mechanisms which I've, I've said in previous presentations is quite a mouthful um, but he splits these auto supportive mechanisms up in, into sort of three separate stages so he talks about the windless mechanism which we'll go into in a tick uh, close packing of the calcaneal cuboid joint um, and the locked wedge effect and what he basically said is for all of this to happen and for the foot to function correctly you've got to have that um, enough range of motion weight bearing in the first MPJ before you start uh, what he also says is the mechanics rely little on muscular activation and they're strictly strictly mechanical actions facilitated by healthy biomechanics um, at the first MPJ. Now we'll query that a little bit later but in a nutshell that pretty much describes that the first MPJ has got to work properly for, for everything else to sort of come into line. Um, I say into line to work properly. Um, and this is quite a good image if you think about it in engineering terms of how the windlass actually works. So if you think about the hallux as being uh, like a lever um, and the joint as being a pulley system as you, you lift up or as you dorsiflex the hallux or you lift up the lever that pulls on the plantar ponyrosis, pulls the heel and the first met closer together which then raises the arch. Um, now quite a few of the old theories talk about the arch locking we'll look at that a little bit later and it is more to do with um, the arch stiffening up but as I say that I quite like that diagram because it explains it quite well. Now, I've said this before as well, Dannenberg wasn't the first person um, to come up with the windless mechanism. I think it was Hicks that first mentioned it um, back in the 1950s. Um, and again, he describes the hallux a little bit like as a lever or, an an, uh, or a handle. Dorsal flex is the first MPJ, which then pulls on the plantar um, upon neurosis. So a very similar diagram there to the one we've just seen. Um, but basically, um, there must be sufficient dorsiflexion available at the hallux to accommodate the heel lift um, during gait. So as the heel comes off the ground, you've got to have enough range of motion in the first for kind of everything um, to come together. And I've got a little action shot here. There we go. So as the heel comes off the ground, um, you've got your body weight coming down, your ground reaction force coming up. So that stiffens the mid-tarsal joints in there. But again, so you need... Um, the range of motion there to enable um, that to happen. Right, so that's all well and good. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way, certainly for a lot of the patients we see. Um, so for all this to happen, we do need sufficient dorsiflexion at the first MPJ as the hill comes off the ground in gait. Um, so, um, so yeah, both, so whether you've got a functional hallux limitus or structural hallux, limit, hallux limitus, both of these will result um, in a decreased ability for the first MPJ to, to dorsiflex. So what you end up getting with that is forced motion within that joint. So the joint doesn't really want to bend, but you're forcing it to do that um, as you move through the sagittal plane. So what you end up getting as a result of that um, is wearing down on the joint surfaces and you get um, joint deterioration. Um, and so, so both of these can lead to deformities. So whether you've got a structural hallux limitus, which has um, recurred because, or occurred because someone's had a trauma there, or whether it's a functional thing, um, both of those um, yeah, do have the potential um, to lead on um, to other things. Um, and I've mentioned some of these here. So again, it could be a greater longer list. It's just a few ideas. Some of the more common ones, so things like hallux valgus, hallux rigidus, osteoarthritis, osteochondritis, um, even something like maybe a patient coming back every six weeks to have pinched callus or plantar callus removed underneath the first um, or medial hallux callus, that's another one you see quite commonly. Or perhaps you see more at-risk patients and they've got pressure ulcers that are always breaking down underneath the first, that, that can also be part of this as well. And you can also get things like joint inflammation. Um, because of the um, the integrity of the joint and it not sort of functioning in, in the way that it should be. And you get things like osteophytic lipping. So those patients that come in and they can feel a ridge um, on the top of their first MPJ and they're sort of questioning what it is. That, that's usually a result of years of this sort of hallux limitus going on. Um, and then you get that um, osteo kind of build up um, on that top surface there. Now, when it comes to, to treatment with an orthotic, it's not just a case of picking a shelf off, well, a device off the shelf with FHL written on it, of, of which there are many, 
Um, it's always better, I think, to understand the pattern mechanics behind what's actually going on in order to, to best describe. Um, and it might be you do all this and you still end up doing a first met cutout. Um, but I, I think possibly through marketing and, and other sort of mediums, this has almost been simplified to the extent that you think if you've got functional hallux limiters, you just need to pick up a device that says FHL on it. But as I say, that may well work, but it is always better to understand a little bit more about what's going on um, before you decide uh, to do that. So first of all, let's look at the pathomechanics for a structural um, hallux limitus. So in a very basic nutshell, um, it's quite straightforward. You get trauma to the joint, that alters the integrity, which then reduces the range of motion. So it's kind of simple enough. Um, so it might be things like they've had a crush injury um, or a fracture or a previous fracture, or it might even be nerve damage or maybe something like a charco joint. Um, so anything basically which has affected the integrity of that joint. So you end up with um, osteoarthritic changes and then you end up with the resultant um, hallux rigidus over time where you hardly get any movement in the joint at all. So functional hallux limitus is a little bit more complex and that's really because we don't understand fully um, why you might have a perfectly acceptable or a good range of motion um, during your assessment when they're not weight bearing but as soon as the foot goes into weight bearing that then becomes um, constricted. So what we can do, um, what we can generally do is, is look and see through our assessment what's happening and then from that we can actually we can make general assumptions. Um, so what we also know um, is whether you're looking at a structural hallux limitus or a functional hallux limitus, both of these are likely to lead to deformities. Um, and the, the common ground for both of them, I think, really, is the fact that during weight bearing or gait, there isn't enough range of motion at the first as the heel comes off the ground. So it's effectively forcing the joint to move, um, basically, when it doesn't want to. Um, so we're back to a scenario um, I think I use with a lot of patients. It's a bit like having a car where you haven't balanced your tyres properly. Um, something has to compensate, else, compensate elsewhere to accommodate um, what's happening, and that can lead uh, to wear and tear. So there's basically compensations going on, but that doesn't always occur um, at the same place. Now, this is a paper here by Rukis um, and his colleagues. hope I've pronounced that right. But it gives us a good idea um, of how the position of the first ray can have an effect on the first MPJ uh, range of motion. But more specifically, how dorsiflexing that first ray um, can limit the range of motion in the actual joint. So in this particular experiment and this research that they did, uh, they found that um, the first MPJ dorsiflexion, so the dorsiflexion at the, the joint, this actually um, decreased by 19% if they moved the first ray um, into four mils um, or into four millimeters of, um, of dorsiflexion. Um, and they found that it, um, yeah, if they moved that again from, from four millimeters to eight millimeters, so if they increased the dorsiflexion even more, um, then there was an even greater percentage of um, decreased dorsiflexion. So basically, just by um, holding the, the first met and moving that into dorsiflexion and changing the position of the joint, that reduced the amount of range of motion available um, at the first MPJ. So, so what they surmise is that the position of the first ray has a significant influence on the first MPJ um, range of motion in stance phase, and that's quite crucial. Um, so it's quite easy to see here that if you, if you maybe jam up the first ray somehow, perhaps with the wrong orthotic, or maybe they've got funny footwear, or perhaps you've used a, a poor casting technique, you could actually be making um, matters worse, but, but we will talk a little bit about uh, casting later on. Um, now it's easy to describe, but easier, I think, when you look at things in a picture. Um, and this is an illustration here, which I got from um, Neil's Disorders of the Foot. But it shows quite nicely how the position of the metatarsal, so we're actually looking at the, the metatarsal, they're not the joint, but how the position of that um, affects joint function and it effectively, effectively jams up that joint space, um, which you can see there. They've marked it with the red star and the picture on the right hand side. Um, now, if you've got a skeleton of a foot in your clinic, I would um, have a play around with it and try pushing up on the metatarsal, so you're dorsiflexing the metatarsal, and then, then try to bend the joint, the first toe joint at the same time, and you'll see how moving that metatarsal basically just changes 
you know, I use the word alignment, but it changes the alignment of that joint. So then when you try to bend it, um, you haven't got the same joint space and it just yeah doesn't bend quite so easily. So so yeah, do have a play about with a skeleton model, although remember they're not quite the same, held quite the same together as you you've got with a, a real foot. But you can try this on patients as well, people that have got a good um, range of motion, try this non-weight bearing just by jamming up. Um, when you've got them on the couch, jam up that first ray and then try and move the joint and you can sort of feel a different stiffness and a different way in which that functions. So, But that's basically the fundamentals of um, what happens here. So let's look at what causes this or let's look at some of the pathomechanics. So uh, Rukas' paper stated quite nice and clearly that it's three different foot types that can lead um, to functional hallux limitus um, and they cited them as an everted calcaneus uh, flexible forefoot valgus and a plantar flexed first ray. Now that all sounds nice and simple, um, but it's a bit like, I'm not sure if any of you are usually use this analogy as well, I'm not sure if any of you have got the, um, the big grey Valmassy book and in one of the pages on there it's got a nice square um, split into nine and it tells you what foot type you get and then what conditions you get as a result of those foot types. So when you're first learning, it's um, wonderfully simple. And as I say, when I first qualified, I thought, oh, brilliant. When a patient comes in with this, they're going to have these problems. And But as any of us know that have been in practice uh, long enough, it just unfortunately doesn't always work um, that simply. So essentially what the paper says is that all of these foot types will um, increase the gram reaction force, so GRF there, short for gram reaction force, under the first um, MET head. Um, so basically it creates more force um, in that area for a longer period of time and actually at an earlier point in the gait cycle. Um, and the illustrations I put on there is just to clarify, or, well just, just so you can see when I'm talking about an everted calc. So the picture on the left, um, then if you can see it, it's got A, B and C, so A is an inverted calc, B is your normal neutral foot position and then C is that calcaneus in an inverted position. Um, and the next picture along you've got sort of looking down the foot, it shows your, your forefoot valgus and then the other picture shows um, a plantar flex first met. So yeah, just a little bit of a recap there. So, as I say, it all sounds nice and simple, um, but once you've seen a good few patients in clinic, you'll notice, as I say, they can't all be put into nice little boxes. So, I guess firstly, do all of your patients that come in with these three foot types have a functional hallux limitus, or do they all have um, hallux valgus? Do they all have problems with their first MPJ or osteoarthritic changes? Um, and I think the answer to that is some will um, and some won't, but there definitely isn't a hard and fast rule for it. Um, I ought to also mention at some point, and I haven't gone into great depth about it in this conversation, but I ought to mention um, the dreaded pronation word here as well. Um, as for a long time, and, and so certainly when I first qualified, we thought that um, over pronation, I'll say in inverted commas, um, cause functional hallux limitus. But actually, if you Google images of, I don't know, elite marathon runners or, or Usain Bolt's feet, you'll see that they've got a classic overpronated or maximally pronated foot, but then they don't necessarily have too many problems with hallux limitus. Um, it certainly doesn't seem to affect their running. So it's not quite as simple as putting down overpronation as a cause of functional hallux limitus. Um, also as well you'll find some patients will have a functional hallux limitus um, and they're not maximally pronated at all. So again it's not as simple as saying an overpronated foot type leads to functional hallux limitus because again sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Now while you're thinking about that I'm just going to sidetrack a little bit um, and mention stiffness. Now the term or the word stiffness is being used quite a lot now um, and there's quite a lot of good research out there um, which focuses, focuses a lot on those all important um, smaller intrinsic muscles of the foot. So the one that a lot of us, myself included, tend to forget the names of. Um, but there's a chap in Australia um, called uh, Dr. Luke Kelly and he's published some really good stuff in recent years so it's worth having a look at his work um, especially in relation to the arch and, and the plantar fascia. Uh, but essentially he's found that the intrinsic muscles play a very important role um, in stiffening the foot to various degrees in another. Um, there's also evidence now uh, that the, the metatarsal joint doesn't lock. So previously and when we looked at Dannenberg's work and again certainly in the past when I've talked to patients and explained how the gait cycle works and you say the heel comes off the ground and the midfoot locks and it creates a stable structure. What we know now is it doesn't just simply um, lock 
um, it goes through various um, or varying degrees of or stages of stiffness. So it's just not as black and as, um, white as the foot locks or the foot doesn't lock. Um, and then Kevin Kirby has also done quite a lot of research or a lot of work recently looking into this. Um, and again, this is worth looking up on um, if you're interested in it. Uh, but basically, he talks about, um, he's called it the Longitudinal Arch Sharing System, which is abbreviated to LALSS. And he said that when that fails, um, other elements or other pieces of anatomy um, within the arch uh, will still maintain the longitudinal arch integrity but with increased tension and loading forces so basically if, if one thing goes and let's say he talks about the different layers and the different structures but if something's weak like perhaps your plantar intrinsic muscles then that's going to put more force and more load um, on some of the other muscles so that's sort of yeah quite interesting as well um, now, I haven't tied that in specifically with functional hallux limitus, um, and in, in all honesty, I don't have an answer to that. Um, but hopefully you can see from this that there are many elements of, uh, uh, um, to play here, um, and the role of the intrinsic muscles within the foot is very important. We shouldn't forget them. So I always think that's something, and certainly since some of this research has come out, um, this is something I always tend to keep in the, the background now. So although they're not coming in necessarily, you think, with an intrinsic smaller foot muscle problem, I quite often now look at um, whether that could be a contributing factor. Um, and I do concentrate a lot more now on intrinsic foot muscle strength along with prescribing orthoses. So, so that's something that's certainly changed my practice in recent years. Um, so basically the wireless mechanism is often referred to um, as activated or not activated. Um, and I've read as well about the wireless me mechanism um, is effective or, or ineffective. But is that a true representation of what's happening? So if we think in terms of stiffness and things getting gradually stiff and, and gradually unstiff, um, is it it's not necessarily locking or, or unlocking or being effective or infecting or ineffecting? It's I would say probably going through many um, many shades of grey. So. And I think as well, if you, if you really get into your physics and your biomechanics and you start looking at things like stress-strain relationships and different viscoelasticity um, of different biological tissue, and, and remember this is biological tissue we're looking at, this is humans, so although in the past we've looked at things in engineering terms and that's very helpful to do that, we've got to remember it's biological tissue we're dealing with. Um, but if, if you look at all that kind of stuff, you'll see that um, it's different for skin, muscles, ligaments, bone, um, and then it's different as well between different individuals. So, so while the engineering principles of the wineless mechanism um, and first wave function um, are nice to help us understand, um, we do have to keep in mind that we're not dealing with a machine, we're dealing with an actual person, um, which is far more um, complicated, unfortunately. Otherwise, I guess we'd all be fixing cars, wouldn't we, not treating patients. So. Right, now I did go off on a bit of a tangent there um, with the stiffness, but I do think that's important to, to mention and also important remem to remember. So we come back now to the first MPJ and um, so just to recap so if the ground reaction force um, tries to dorsiflex the first ray um, sometimes um, the midfoot collapses instead um, so it is important as well even if you're just looking at um, first ray functional if you think that's where the problem is it is important as well to take a step back or come further back up the foot and look and see what the range of motion um, is like in your mid tarsal joint as well um, and also what the stiffness is like in the mid dorsal joint. So you're looking at range of motion, um, but you're also looking at how stiff that movement is, is as well. Um, and potentially, and this is just a scenario really, if your patient um, has one of the um, foot types that I mentioned before, so your everted calc, your full foot valgus, um, or your plantar flex first ray, if it's got one of those three foot types, and it's got a reduced super, supernatory range of motion in the mid tarsal joint, then the likelihood is um, the increased ground reaction force in the medial column will have to compensate at the first ray. So it can't compensate at the mid tarsal joint and in and around the arch area because it's too stiff. So then it goes on to the next place that it can, and that's your, that's your first ray, and that's when you start to get um, functional hallux limitus. Um, Having said that, it could also happen the other way around. So if your patient has less stiffness at the mid tarsal joint, um, these patients may be dissipating these ground reaction forces elsewhere. So this could explain, I suppose, why, why um, with our classic pronated foot, if you like, with our everted calc and our forefoot supernatus and, and so on, um, some of them will have met problems, first met problems, um, and some of them won't. 
Um, but the truth is we just don't know for sure. So all we can do is make educated guesses and, and that comes through um, our assessment and knowing what we're looking at. So let's just have a little look at the test for this. And I've only got one picture of this. I couldn't find any others. Um, but typically for most of us, I think we would use the Jack's test or, or Hubsha's test, whichever you want to call it. Um, Jack's test, I think, is just to literally you can either lift the big toe up in weight bearing or you can't lift the hallux. And, and Hubsha's tends to categorise it into naught for no, you can't, and then various degrees from one, two, um, and three. So the thing to remember with this is not to let your patient help you. So get them looking straight ahead. I normally get them stomping up and down on um, marching on the step for about 10 seconds so they get into the, to a, um, a comfortable position. And also remember, it's the first MPJ that you're testing, not the IPJ. So if you've, and you can see on the picture here, his thumb, the person that's doing the test, has gone under the IPJ. So he's only putting the force, or he's only trying to dorsiflex the MPJ. If you just hold on to the very tip of the toe, then you end up dorsiflexing the IPJ and the MPJ. So even if it's hard, you need to get your sort of your thumb right under there. And ideally, what we want to see um, is lifting up that hallux. Then you want to see your windlass um, come into play. So you want to see that arch start to rise, and you should, if you look at the leg and the knee, <coughs> oh, excuse me, you should see that start to externally rotate as well, um, and that would be, um, yeah, a good Jack's test or a positive Jack's test, or would score about a, a three um, on a Hubsha's. So quite a nice, easy test to do. It's nice for patients as well um, to explain. Um, and again, this test has been around and well used for decades. I'm just going to take a sip of coffee. That's the trouble with webinars. Nobody ever asks any questions till the end and <coughs> end up losing my voice. So, okay, so if you haven't heard of Jack's or Hubsha's test, that's pretty much what it is in a nutshell. If you have and you've used it, um, I'm going to stick in a quick devil's advocate here. Um, so this was a paper which was published in uh, 2014. Um, and they wasn't so keen on the, on the Hubsha's test, really. Um, and what they stated... Um, in the beginning of the paper was that functional hallux limitus is diagnosed with a static test known as the Hubsch's manoeuvre, um, but the validity for this test has been previously questioned. And it's true, isn't it? We tend to use this test um, to diagnose whether we've got a functional hallux limitus. So what they did, they investigated the validity of the manoeuvre, um, and they also um, investigated whether introducing severity of pronation as a second concurrent test would increase its um, validity. Um, and this is basically what they found. Um, that there was no significant relationship between non-weight bearing and dynamic maximum dorsiflexion and between weight bearing and dynamic maximum dorsiflexion. Um, doo -doo -doo. But a significant relationship between first MPJ dynamic maximum dorsiflexion and severity of pronation. So what they concluded with that was that a positive Hubsha manoeuvre test um, on its own is not a good indicator of limited first MPJ dorsiflexion during dynamic motion. But the pronation, as pronation increases, first MPJ maximum dorsiflexion um, during gait decreases. So they basically said as you increase the pronation, and that's a good indicator, but the Hubsha test on its own, they didn't feel um, was. Um, and then there's this paper, which is a little bit older, which I found as well, um, by, by Halstead and Redmond back in 2006. Uh, and they found that there was no association between maximum dorsiflexion observed during a static weight-bearing examination and that occurring at the same joint during walking. Um, now, I haven't critiqued these at all. And of course, we should always take a balanced view when we look at research. Um, but I would be questioning if, if these findings, I guess, had anything to do with stiffness. So very basically speaking, the amount of force that you'd use to dorsiflex the hallux weight-bearing um, but not moving, so as your patient's just stood there, um, it's just it's just not going to be the same um, as when the patient is walking around um, and loading the joint naturally. Um, then the other thing is, what happens if we stick them in a shoe? That changes everything completely again. So, having said all that, um, personally, I find Jack's test and Hubsha's test helps me with my assessment, um, and I also think it's a really good visual tool when you're trying to explain things to patients. So, if it works for you and it helps you with your assessment and your diagnosis and your prescription and your patients get better, then, you know, I think it's absolutely fine. But I think you do need to just be aware um, of the validity of some of these things and maybe some of the pitfalls with them as well. So, right, that's just a funny little picture I put in there. So, um, I've just chucked this in really, and it's just to make you, just to remind you to think about what you read. 
Um, and I got this really because I've got a friend who, who works in the medical profession, kind of, but it's a different profession. She's not a podiatrist or a physio, but she's absolutely mad keen on children going barefoot. And she's always posting things on Facebook about um, children going barefoot helps brain development and so on and so forth. And she puts research up there, um, but actually when you read it, some of the research she's quoting is actually a little bit sketchy. Um, so having said that, the two papers I just mentioned before um, are not sketchy, but we, we do have to think of things in context. Um, so for argument's sake, if you stopped using Hubsch's test on J or Jack's test based on those two papers I've just mentioned previously, then what do we replace it with? And, and that's the thing, isn't it? So. Right, okay, so let's get on and have a little look at some of the orthotic considerations. Now, um, what we're doing with an orthotic, whether you're casting a patient or prescribing a prefac, these are probably the things you need to consider. So our basic aims, our main aims, is to address the abnormal dorsal flexion at the first ray. So what you'd be trying to do with an orthotic, we'll say be it a um, casted or um, so bespoke, semi-bespoke or um, a, an off-the-shelf device, is you're aiming um, somehow to plantar flex the first way, so bring it down um, with the aim to increase hallux dorsiflexion. flexion. So basically what you're trying to do is reverse what's going on or reverse the process um, of functional hallux limitus and you're trying to do that with the use um, of an orthotic. Now, if you take casts, think very carefully about what you're capturing, because it's not really good enough to just take a mediocre cast and then send it to the lab and expect them to do the guesswork. So the better your cast, the better your orthoses. And these are just a few things to think about here. So when you're taking your cast, um, so we'll talk about plaster of Paris to start with, um, make sure you plan to flex that first ray during casting um, or um, dorsiflex the hallux so you capture that. If you don't do that and you end up um, dorsiflexing the first ray then you'll end up with a device um, which is then going to be pushing up in an area that you don't want to. So if you don't, if you don't do it already um, have a practice, have a go before you do it on a patient but it literally just is a case and it kind of shows in the picture there of just bringing that first ray down and holding it in that position as your plaster goes off. Now a lot of patients, this will, you can do this, this will kind of happen anyway but it is quite important just to make a conscious effort um, to try and do it. Now, I think this is even more important if you're used to taking foam impression boxes, um, because the trouble is when you're doing a foam impression box, semi-weight bearing, as you're pushing the foot down through the foam, you're getting an upward resistance because of the foam. So if they've got quite a flexible first ray, then, then you can end up getting a foam impression or a negative cast where the foam has dorsiflex the first ray. So even if you haven't noticed this um, when you're doing your assessment, if it's more mobile, then naturally because of because of the resistance of the of the foam, um, you're going to end up pushing that up. So you're going to end up capturing like um, a four foot valgus in your in your cast. So it's really important if you, if you tend to like taking foam boxes that you really um, push that first net down uh, or push that first ray down rather. Um, and another thing you can do if you've got a pen is um, if after you've taken your cast if you just put the pen um, into the impression underneath the first met, the fifth met and the heel um, and you'll, you'll just produce a little circle um, as because obviously the pen is smaller in diameter at the tip and then it gets wider as you go sort of further up the nib and what you want is the same um, diameter circle for each of them and, and if, if you've got it's different underneath the first ray or underneath the first ray you know first net rather you know you need to put that foot back in the box and then push down a little bit more so if you're um, using scanners um, again it depends whether you're using weight uh, semi weight bearing or um, or non-weight bearing and um, you still need to think about manipulating that first ray um, if you're doing a scan and that's where you might need your receptionist to take the scan while you manipulate the foot or if you've got very long arms you can manipulate the foot and hold your scanner at the same time but again it depends what kind of scanner you've got um, but as I say it is worth remembering that you might be able to ask your patient to hold their foot in, in neutral position but you can't ask them to um, manipulate their first ray too easily so, so these might be the patients where you want to get some help um, taking those scans so anyway basically a custom orthotic will only be um, as good uh, as your cast and the image there by the way I took out of uh, podiatry today so 
if you think about it, um, the first ray is easy um, to accidentally leave the first ray dorsal flex. I'm sure I've done it before. Um, so, and I kind of said this in the last slide, but basically what happens is that your orthotic shell will be in a dorsal flex position, which will then create an even, what, even more of a force, uh, basically where you don't want it to. Um, it's also remember, more important to remember to correct any supinatus in the forefoot where you can. Um, and this basically just results in less cast work and you happen to write less than the prescription for your lab. Um, so basically you're making the corrections that you want for your device for your patient yourself rather than relying on the lab to do it. So you just you tend to get a better device um, from doing it that way. Um, and there's a few more things we consider or we can consider when doing a prescription. So minimal arch bill is one. So normally speaking, you'd have um, a three mil addition on an arch, which basically means that the arch is on your orthotic is lowered by about three mil from where the arch would be um, on the neutral foot. And the reason for that is because as you go through mid stance, the foot needs to pronate a little bit. So if you jam it up too much, um, you basically the patient doesn't tolerate it. Um, and I think that's the biggest no-no with it is that patients don't always tolerate it. But if you do use a minimum arch fill, this basically means that there's no um, additional plaster added um, to the positive cast. So the device you get back, the arch will pretty much fit um, the arch of your um, neutrally casted patient. But this can actually help hold um, the first ray um, in a more dorsal flex position. So this can work really well with some patients, but it is important to remember um, that it isn't always tolerated and that that is... Um, it's no good doing something for a patient which you think mechanically and engineering terms will work and, and they just can't walk in it. So if you want to try this, it might be better trying it on a prefab first with a higher arch uh, before you go down the casted route. Um, and then, of course, you've got rear foot posts. Um, you're better off having a post rather than doing an intrinsic um, rear foot post in my correction. In my, um, my correction? in my experience, um, basically because it, it gives more stability to the, the device. If you've got a device um, which is rocking because you haven't got a stable rear foot post on there, then you, it is likely that you're going to load more um, onto the front, um, onto the, the, the distal edge, and then therefore again put more, first, more force for your MPJ where you don't want it. So your rear foot post, you can put your correction in there, um, which can offload or, or reduce some of the pronation you're getting if that's what you want to do, but it also provides stability as well. Um, the other good thing, um, or the other thing that works really well for this, um, and Kevin Kirby again has, has, has written a lot on it, is adding a Kirby sky. So again, this helps manipulate your ground reaction forces at the rear foot, um, which will um, in turn reduce the amount of force you're putting down through um, the medial column. Uh, first met cutouts, so I think they're on just about every single um, functional hallux limitus uh, prefab, but they work really well because they allow the first met or the first, um, well, yeah, the, the first metatarsal to drop down or plantar flex, which basically puts um, the joint in a better position to preload. Um, and then you've got cluffy wedges. So basically, that's like um, a distal wedge which sits um, under the hallux, so it almost adds like a rocker sort of within the shoe, and that can work really well to help preload um, the first net if you've got a functional hallux limitus, but you've got to have the range of motion available there when they're not weight bearing. And if you've got somebody that's maybe got osteophytic um, lipping and you stick a cluffy wedge in, you're going to end up making it um, even more um, painful. So I've used it. It's worked really well for me on some patients and not so well on others. And again, it's one of those things that I've just kind of tried it before I've prescribed it. And usually the patient will walk around the room and they'll either say yes or they'll say no. Um, but effectively, it's, it's aiding sagittal plane um, movement if you've got the range of motion available, non-weight bearing. Um, Okay, so be, be a little bit careful with forefoot posting. Um, it's not as common now. I remember about 15 years ago, it seemed that everybody was sticking forefoot posting on just about everything. Um, but it just doesn't seem to be something that's prescribed as much now. Um, and I think that's probably because maybe we didn't understand some of the effects it could have been having. Um, so this is where shell material um, really comes into play. So if you've stuck forefoot posting on something and you've got a flexible shell material, what that can effectively do is end up just dorsiflexing the first ray, which remember this is what we absolutely don't want to do. Um, and it could end up also supinating the foot and the midfoot. So while you think you're correcting the foot position, if you've got a flexible shell, you're only manipulating that part of the shell and you're creating an actual torsion on the shell. 
So with forefoot posting, especially extrinsic forefoot posting, you ideally want to be using a stiffer material so that basically that antipronation moment that you're putting on there in the forefoot is then transferred all the way back to the rear foot, which is probably the reason you put it on there in the first place. So, um, so there, that is, that's definitely worth um, considering. Um, and then you also need to think about material stiffness. And I, I know lots of people that get caught up in, oh, I only prescribe one material. I like, all my patients get medium density EVA. And medium density EVA is an excellent material and it does work for the vast majority of patients. But, but you do have to think about your patient, their weight, and the load and the forces that they're, they're putting through the specific areas of their feet. So it may be that you've got an eight stone marathon runner um, but if they're loading the medial column of their foot really, really heavily, or they've got really high supination resistance, then you're going to use stiffer material because something like medium density EVA is just going to deform really quickly. Um, but again, it all depends exactly on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and also, it's really important always to think about um, tolerance. So will your patient tolerate it? And is it going to go in their footwear as well? So. Right. Again, there's, there's countless different adaptations and kinetic wedges and cutouts and met domes, I think, have been shown to work quite well for hallux limitus as well. I had a colleague who um, looked at that for their MSC. Um, but I'm just going to talk about the reverse Mortons. Um, and you can prescribe this um, onto a custom or even if you've just got a prefab and some semi-compressed felt in clinic, just some three mil semi-compressed felt or three mil adhesive back pour on, you can quite easily just stick it on a prefab. So basically what it does, um, you can see from the picture there, it's the dark blue area that you're adding, um, literally just adding another layer to. So your dark blue area is going to be about three mil higher than your light blue area there. Um, it basically increases the ground reaction force over the rest of the MET head, so your, your two to five, which then in turn lowers um, the ground reaction force under your first. Um, it also allows the first rate of plant effects, um, which, which potentially puts um, the joint in a better position um, and ready to load. So again, I've used this loads of times. It works really, really well for these sorts of patients, but it's absolutely crucial that they've got the right footwear because once you start adding padding on and once you add three mils of this and one mil of that and you know it all adds up and if they end up coming back and the first raise fine but they've got loads of dorsal ulcers on there and IPJs then you've sort of cured one problem and created another so they absolutely need to be on board with with the footwear um, with this one. Um, now, there's, there's absolutely loads more I could talk about on this topic, um, and there's loads more variations on prescriptions that we could mention, um, and that's without going down the route of things like joint manipulation and other therapies, which, which have been proved um, to work really well. Um, but hopefully it's given you a little bit of food for thought, um, and I think the important thing to remember is that we still don't know exactly 100% how orthoses work for each patient. Um, and we can probably all think of the patient that's come back with the devices in the wrong shoes six weeks later um, and their symptoms are better. And then you're stuck with that dilemma of do you take the devices out and say, OK, come back next year or never come back again? Or do you say, actually, you've had them in the wrong shoes and then you have to try and explain that one? Um, so, so, yeah, it just goes to show even when we think we know how they work, you know, someone chucks a curveball at us. What I do think is crucial is understanding the pattern mechanics for um, a particular problem um, and I think this gives you a much clearer framework um, to work in. So for example, um, looking at the mid-tarsal joint that we mentioned earlier um, and even the ankle joint, we didn't really go into the ankle joint but that's um, crucial to look at as well, especially if you're looking at things moving in the sagittal plane. Um, but as you say, you do always need to um, look at the bigger picture, otherwise it's a bit like having a bucket with holes in, you're filling it up with trying to treat one thing but say so not looking at um, uh, the broader picture there. So, and I think one and knowing your anatomy, I always stick that one in. I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, but I think certainly for first MPJ pain, um, osteoarthritis in the first ray and functional hallux limitus, I mean, I've seen countless, countless patients with those issues and problems over the years. And it never, ever is a one-size-fits-all. And especially when you've got patients that have come in and they've perhaps had a hallux valgus operation and then you're kind of stuck to, to pick up the pieces afterwards. Um, it does tend to be a little bit of fiddling about with that patient and seeing what, what works. And while most of the time probably would end up going on to a, a casted functional device, um, from my own experience, a lot of the time I'll spend a little bit of time messing about with things like semi-compressed felt and pour on and different forefoot padding adaptations to try and get that joint working how I want it to. Um, so it, it certainly isn't a case of 
the patient has this um, and this is the treatment for it. There are, there are so many different things that you can try. And I think the trick behind it is um, having the ability um, and the patience to do that and also explaining it to your patient as well. So, right, I think we've gone a bit over time there actually. And hopefully this isn't the point at which I find that none of you can actually hear any of it. Um, but Okay, there is an option somewhere for you to ask questions. And then I think somewhere I've got a button to look at the questions and then I can answer them if you want to put some in. Um, there's the references there. I will say something about my references. Actually, if any of you are hot on references in systems, I probably would have failed my um, exams on these references. So I definitely haven't got the dots and the full stops and the so on and so forth in, in the right place. So use them to look up papers, but don't criticise me on my um, ability to follow the Harvard system to a T. There we go. Actually, I've got a funny feeling on this. There's a 30 second delay. So if you are sending questions in, um, if there's, I think there is a delay between when they come in or when my voice gets to you. Ah, uh, right. I've only just worked out how to open the questions. <laughs> right, so someone's asked there, um, just had a 50-year-old lady with HAV, which is causing pain. Um, she does have an inverted calcaneus. What orthotic would you suggest is best for her? I'm newly qualified pods, so pretty nervous about biomechanics. Well, first of all, the thing with biomechanics, um, it's not like holding a scalpel where if you slip, you could lock the toe off. Um, with biomechanics, if you start with a prefab um, and just do one thing at a time, there's not too much that can go wrong, especially if you explain to your patient exactly what you're doing and, crucially, to stop wearing the device if it causes any problems. Now, what I would do... Um, to that question, I would probably get something pretty, like the most common prefab is a medium density EVA device. Now, I don't know if that's because that's what most people need or whether that's because that is the safest one out there. Um, but I would probably go, if you get a one of the bio-advanced devices full length, um, if you go on the um, LBG Medical website, you can see them on there. Get a medium density one full length because at the end of the day you can chop a full length down, but you can't um, add a bit onto a three-quarter length one. And I would probably add a little bit of medial posting on there, maybe two or four degrees, um, and just see how that helps to start with, and then look and see how much range of motion you've got in that joint. The thing with HA, with Halix abducto valgus or HAV, um, is they might have lots of range of motion, in which case you can fiddle about with things to get that working better, or they might have a limited range of motion, like a structural Halix limitus. 
Um, and if that's the case, you can do things with sometimes like cushioning or doing a Morton's extension under the joint can work quite well. Um, but yeah, certainly in this case, I'd start simple um, and do one thing at a time, see what works, see what doesn't. Um, and I've been qualified, I don't know, when's I qualified? 2003. And I'll still, if I see someone with an HAV, I'll know it's never going to be. Sometimes it first thing works first time, other times you spend ages messing about trying to, to get things to work with it. Um, so yeah, it can be a complex problem, but. Um, but don't be nervous about biomechanics. Um, do three of your messages. And Thomas, but when casting with functional hallux limiters, you recommend plantar flex in the first ray, but not when casting normal foot, correct? Uh, I suppose it's more pertinent if they've got functional hallux limiters. Um, I've got to be honest, when I cast, I always tend to plan to flex the first ray anyway, because even if they haven't got fun functional hallux limiters, I don't want to cause one because I've done a dodgy cast. So I, th I think plan to flexing it and dorsal flexing the hallux is just quite a good habit to get into anyway. Um, why not just cut out first ray and do a cast normally? Um, yeah, you can do that. Um, the only thing you've got to be careful with, and again, first ray cutouts, we used to do loads of them sort of 15 odd years ago, but then if you take the whole first ray out, you can make the medial side of the orthotic quite unstable, and you make it narrower as well, which can be great, um, but it can also limit the amount of correction you can then put through the orthotic. Um, but again, you've got to think as well, if you've been doing this for years and, you've, and this works for you, then you don't always want to sort of, might not want to change things now. Um, is there any orthotic remedy for structural hallux limitus patient has 30 degrees ROM non-weight bearing? I mean, if they've got structural hallux limitus, you're not. I mean, unless you're going to go down the the, um, the route of joint manipulation, which isn't my um, specialism, but I know people have done it and get very very good results with it, and they get more range of motion through doing joint manipulation. Um, I guess it depends what you're trying to achieve. So if when they bend, if when they bend the joint, they get pain, then your orthotic um, remedy, if you like, wants to be to try and reduce that range of motion. Because effectively, if with a structural hallux limitus with only 30 degrees, if you leave it, eventually that joint's going to fuse, and when it completely fuses, the patient's not going to get pain anymore. Um, but they might not want to wait, you know, two, three, five years for that to happen. Um, so what works really well for this, and, and I find this is brilliant, for, it tends to be older men that have got osteoarthritis in the first MPJ and sort of 30 degrees or less, is if you put a Morton's extension um, underneath the first, so sort of three mils of, say, try it with semi-compressed felt, um, pour on works really well. Um, it's just a shaft pad that goes under the first, and basically that helps reduce the range of motion in that joint. And because you're reducing the range of motion, um, you're, then for, you're therefore stopping or decreasing the pain because it's, a, it's a trying to move the joint that won't move, which is causing the pain. Also, with those sort of patients, I'd be getting them into rocker-style shoes, so you don't want them in a flat, hard court shoe or sort of leather brogue type shoe, which is dead flat underneath and doesn't have much um, cushioning or shock, shock attenuation. So you want them in a trainer style or a walking boot or something which has got a little bit of rock um, underneath the toe post. That tends to work really well as well. Do you have any favourite exercises for intrinsic muscles? Um, this really depends on the sort of patients that you're seeing. So, with older patients, you've, you've, you know, you can you can look up research, you can come up with the best intrinsic foot muscle exercises that are all proven, and so on and so forth. But you've got to think about what your patient's going to do. So for me, um, I tend to get them doing stuff like um, when they're watching their favourite television programme of an evening or they're sitting down uh, or something that they're doing every single day, I'll get them doing things like um, picking up a, or trying to scrunch up a towel with their toes or trying to pick up a pencil with their toes and raising their arch at the same time. Um, so basically things like that which are tailored towards um, that patient because it's no good giving them stuff to do that they're just not going to do. So, um, but yeah, have a look it up. Do you look at um, some of Luke Kelly's work? Um, but yeah, I think you see yeah, the towel exercises um, and getting them to repeat it, but also holding. So once they've scrunched up the towel or picked up the pencil, they're then holding for say five seconds or 10 seconds, and then they're slowly letting go again as well. So you're really working those smaller muscles. Okay, thanks for listening everyone. Take care, bye-bye.